Bienvenue, euh, si vous voulez bien reprendre place pour ce que nous fait encore à l'extérieur. Nous allons vous on va continuer donc avec le troisième chapitre et comme disait toujours Edouard Glissant, il faut dans chaque événement au moins, au moins deux, deux langues. On va maintenant faire uh, un switch et on va parler en français pour ceux qui ont besoin d'une traduction. For those of you who need a translation, uh, there is simultaneous translation available. You can get a little translation Donc, si vous avez besoin d'une interprétation uh, simultanée, uh, il y a des écouteurs. Et voilà, donc s'il s'agit dans, dans les conversations qu'on a fait avec, euh, avec Ming Smith d'ailleurs et avec, avec Joseph Kudelka de deux, deux interviews qui étaient non réalisées dans mon archive, on a déjà euh, souvent eu des conversations avec Samuel, donc je suis très heureux qu'on puisse Here again, we've ça. had many conversations with Samuel. We're working on a book together that will be published by Schreider uh, shortly. Uh, Samuel, I wanted to start with the same question that I asked. Uh, both of your um, fellow photographers. How did you come to photography? Would you, can you say something about how you started? I can say I didn't have a, uh, a view on photography. Um, in the beginning, but it all started in the Central African Republic in 1972. It was uh, at the time when the war was raging in Biafra. Um, and when I came to the Central African Republic, I was with my uncle. My uncle was a, a shoemaker. And people tend to uh, confuse uh, um, a shoe repairman and a shoemaker. And I worked there full time, night and day. And I had chores. I had to keep the house clean for his wife. And I had to go to market and buy uh, food. And when I went to the market, I met a photographer who was uh, um, right at the um, area where we left our neighborhood. And I went to his studio. He is from uh, the same ethnic group as my mother, the Ebos from uh, uh, Niger. And I asked him if I could learn how to become a photographer from him. And he said, no. He said, I had to go through my uncle. And so I asked him, and he he answered that the English-speaking country is different from a French-speaking country. And of course, Nigeria is an English-speaking country. You have to get authorization to start working. But in a French-speaking country, everything is free. And uh, basically, you have to pay uh, somebody who's going to work for you. But anyway, the real problem was that my uncle had to accept that I was going to learn. And I came back uh, to speak to my uncle. There were just the two of us. We came from Nigeria. And he said, no, I want you to stay with me. And you'll go back to Cameroon and you'll learn how to be a joiner. So I thought about this for a long time. And uh, just like a man who loves his wife uh, will listen to her, so I went through her. And I, got, I asked her if she could try to convince my uncle uh, to allow me to go learn photography. And she came back to me and 
and uh, he had not changed his mind, and he still wanted me to learn how to, to make shoes. I had to cut out the the um, the sole of the shoe, and one week after the chores, I cleaned the house. I had to wash the dishes. And I was standing by the door like all African children. And so when he came back and he said, you learned how to uh, photography. What are you doing? What are you waiting for? And I realized that he had accepted, actually, that I go and um, teach the, the trade. So he came to an arrangement with a photographer, and I took off, and I went there. And that's when I started to learn. That's how it happened. Then there's this incredible story that the first works were created for your grandmother. And you wanted to send the pictures to your grandmother. Can we talk about your very first photographs? And uh, why did you want to document yourself or appear to be a different person? Why did you want to borrow an identity? You didn't want to change your identity because I had understood that you wanted to change your identity. And you said, no, that you really wanted to borrow another identity. Well, it all started with the fact that as a child, I had been working very early, and I was found it very tiring, and I really wanted to learn photography. And so if we go back in time, I was born as an uh, abnormal child. I was born in Cameroon. I was actually paralyzed in my hands and my feet. And my mother was not able to get me to get better with uh, traditional Western medicine. So her father, that is my grandfather, was a great um, traditional healer. And since I'm from Cameroon, he uh, said that I had to go leave Cameroon, go to Nigeria to see if uh, anything could be done through his father. And when his father saw me, so I, at that point I was one year old, so I should have been walking. And my feet and my hands were uh, sort of um, cramped and um, he said that we would go see somebody and in fact he wanted to see all the healers in the village and the solution was to see if it came from the hand of God because sometimes that's what the belief is, that this is just God's decision and that it's not anything that can be cured or healed. But if it's the hand of the sorcerer, uh, then it's different and something can be done. And after having consulted these healers, it was the hand of the sorcerer that supposedly was uh, working against my mother and it fell on me. And my father said, okay, so that this is something that can be cured. That uh, she can go back to Cameroon. For uh, 
and she did not want to stay in Nigeria to see what would happen with this process. But after I went through all of this, I was cured and I was able to walk. It took a year, and my mother wanted to take me back to Cameroon. And that's when the war in Biafra started. And unfortunately, she died during the war in Biafra. And I stayed with my grandfather and my grandmother, my maternal grandparents, uh, during the time that the war lasted. And it, it's my maternal grandmother who raised me. And when the, when the war was over, and my uncle had lived in Cameroon during the war and afterwards, and he had come back, our house had been destroyed. And my uncle asked my grandmother whether she would bring me. My grandmother accepted. And why did she accept? She said, because my grandfather was somebody I considered like my father. And since he wasn't there, she could bring me. And she said this because after I was cured, my grandfather didn't want me to leave uh, to live in a big city. Because he basically passed everything on to me. So he wanted me to continue to uh, do what he did after he died. But unfortunately, he died also after the war when we came back in 1970. My grandfather said she couldn't do anything. Uh, and that's how I came to Cameroon to start to work as a shoemaker. And photography, well, I considered my grandmother to be my mother. I didn't know my mother. So, I mean, I really hadn't known my mother, so I considered that my grandmother was like my mother. We were very close. And when I came to Central African Republic, I wanted to send photographs. It was a way for her to communicate quickly with my grandmother, who was worried. And when my uncle went back to Nigeria and say, how is he? He would say, uh, he's well, and and he showed me the photo. And she said, the, the photograph, uh, it doesn't mean anything. I, if somebody dies, you know, you can show a photograph and you don't know that they died. So the idea for me to make these photographs and to pass them on to my grandmother is because I didn't have the money to uh, pay for the trip to go to Nigeria. And I would make pictures, and I would wanted them to be for my grandmother so she could see that I was alive. That's amazing. That's beautiful. Maybe we can look at some of these images. I think you've brought some images to show us. So this is in the 1970s. And I wanted to come back to these questions. It's amazing what takes place in the studio. So uh, during the day, when this, during normal working hours, you're working as a commercial a photographer. And then once the studio closes, it's uh, free time, or your time is freed up. And you can engage in radical experimentation. So could you tell us, how did you start this practice? And you, it seems that you were already uh, anticipating what will come later if you look at the overlaps with Cindy Sherman. How is it that so young you had this kind of epiphany when uh, the uh, studio closes in the evening and then you start to experiment in this way? 
As I just explained, my mother will usually in Africa, when a woman has her first child, after three months, uh, she has pictures taken to have uh, memories. Because, but my mother did not do this because I was an abnormal child. I was paralyzed, so uh, she was ashamed and uh, uh, she did not have this uh, photograph done. So when I became a photographer, I tried to make myself beautiful as best I could. And so I looked at American magazines and and how clothes were being worn then in the fashion of the 70s. And I would make uh, those kinds of clothes and I would dress up. I was dressing like uh, uh, Americans because I just loved their stories. And my grandmother was saying, because when I was normal, she was saying, if we were still in the times of slavery, you would get sold. Because then, if uh, children were not good and did not obey their parents, they were told uh, uh, that they would be taken to some place where they could be sold. So I used the American style so that I could show to my grandmother that I was normal, that I feel well, that I'm growing, I'm no longer hungry. But she didn't understand. She wanted to see me alive. And if I had any film left at the end of the day, or even two, uh, two uh, pictures, because we had a twelve, we know we had a twelve picture uh, film. It was Kodak, twelve exposures. So if I hadn't finished the twelve exposures, I didn't want to uh, waste any of that film. And, and that's how I came to make these pictures and without anybody seeing it. Because I slept in my studio. So when everybody was gone, I simply locked myself up and I feel myself. And so when I was doing pictures of clients, this is what I did. And in this way, I was able to make these pictures and to uh, send them to my grandmother. She had been to school, uh, so she couldn't look at the dates. Uh, she just saw pictures. And she could see her son, who's alive. Can we see other ones? So basically, I uh, copied the pictures. I had a friend who had come from Mecca who gave me this picture. And then there was a picture who had gone to Romania to study, and he sent me a picture or, or a postcard with his bridge. And so I decided to paint that on the wall, and people could come and have their portraits made as if we were in Europe. And here, the same thing, a country who'd come back from Mecca. And because then we were in Central African Republic. The other day, I was talking with Sidney Sherman about this idea of borrowing identities or having multiple identities. And she said that she feels anonymous in her work. When she looks at her own images, she doesn't see herself. And they're not uh, self-portraits. It's for her a way to disappear. 
Do you see that the same way? Are these self-portraits or are you trying to disappear? She's right to say that. But there's a difference in, because of our African customs. It's not a self-portrait, it's a way to disappear. But for us in Africa, And when I was making these photographs, what were my friends saying? They were saying, you know, the camera and the photograph, when you photograph somebody, they're not images. It's more like spirits here. It's the hidden shadow. You are selling with that camera. You're making lots of photographs, and when you do that, it's basically your spirit that's gone away, and you won't live as long. And in Africa, we consider the image. When you look at a picture of yourself, you're looking at your shadow. And one day, you're going to die. No, so you should not photograph yourself a lot or be photographed a lot because otherwise you'll die faster. So if it's not a self-portrait, what would it be? I would say it's my spirit. And I was afraid because I didn't want to lose my spirit and I didn't want to sell my spirit. But it's also true that it can't be a self-portrait. So maybe her spirit is disappearing. Maybe that's how I understood it. When we had our talk in London, there was somebody in the audience said that they consider you as the pioneer of the selfie. And you said uh, recently in an interview with El País that you see a difference between the selfies and your portraits. And you say that the difference between those who are taking a selfie and you is that those who are taking the selfies are showing themselves as they are, but they don't try to explain to themselves what they are. So they actually keep their secrets. And you say that you're not like that. You say that you tell what you see. I'd like to understand this a little bit better. It was in Spanish and I don't speak Spanish very well, so I wanted to better understand the difference between a selfie and your photos. Well, I've asked myself that question. Is it a selfie? Well, first of all, how did it start? In what year did it start? Maybe with the smartphones, and people simply started to take selfies. And when they're taking selfies, they really want to show themselves. And I was doing self-portraits, but there were no selfies then. I was photographing myself. And it's a way of honoring what was doing in the 1970s. And if you compare that with a selfie that you make today, so uh, if people want to call what I'm doing is a selfie, uh, fine. If they want to consider what I'm doing, which I consider to be selfish as a selfie, then I can say that I started the selfie. And then people will say it's my fault. 
But really, what I'm doing is a self-portrait. A selfie. This is a selfie of the 1970s. But what they're calling a selfie today is a selfie of the year 2000. Because I think it started sometimes in, in the 2000s. So, in other words, what I'm doing is a self portrait, not a selfie. If you want me to do a selfie, I could do it. But I've never shown my selfies. And I keep it for myself. And I don't know if it will ever be important the way I was doing a self-portrait. Actually, I didn't know what it would become. So a selfie, as far as I'm concerned, would be 20 or 30 years after I started working. So this is this fantastic series that we're looking at, which was discovered or rediscovered by the art world quite late. I think it was the 1990s. And I remember when Oki was the first person who told me about you. And after rediscovering these amazing works from the 1990s, then in 97 you started uh, this series that we're going to talk about because it's very important here in Paris that we talk about these images. But I want to know, can you tell us something about what happened in between? We have pictures from 73 to 78. Then what happened between 78 and 97? Because that's two decades. Okay. This series kind of ends then. And then in 94, I met an African photographer in Mali. And, and there was a gallery who wanted to work with me, and then in New York as well. I don't know if I can tell you how the first meeting went with this Malian photographer. I was approached by a French photographer. His name is Bernard Descamps. He met me for the first uh, Rencontre des Photographies Africaines in Bamako. This was back in 1993. He had, uh, before meeting me, a representative of Kodak in Central African Republic that was selling Kodak products there. And uh, so this person had come with his representative, and he said that he wanted to see me. He said, do you're French? And, and uh, he said, uh, I'm not French. I haven't been French since 1968. I'm a Central African. And this person asked me, for negatives, because they were going to be the uh, premier rencontre des photographes africains by Marco. So did I have any negatives of my photographs? I showed some photographs of my clients, and he said, no, not that. We're already in color. And uh, most of the people who uh, want their photograph taken in Africa are women. And I said that people don't like black and white. And he said, no, I'd like to see the black and white from the 1970s. And I said, these are my own photographs. I'm giving them for the future of my own children. And maybe tomorrow I'll get married and I'll have children and these children would like to see their daddy when he was uh, young and beautiful, young and handsome. So he told me to show me the photographs. And he looked at this and he said, this is what I want to see. Can I take this to Paris? He said, he told me there was a, an 
exhibition. And I said, well, what's that? We're going to show photographs of Africans uh, in the past. And it's the first time it's going to be done. And so he asked me if he could take the pictures. I said, yes. And he said, OK. I'll take it, and we'll see if the jury selects it. Then you can participate in uh, this event in Bamako. And that's how it started. But the day I got the phone call, and then I got a letter uh, asking me if I can confirm that I would participate. And I was asked, why didn't I send photographs to Bamako? And they said, here's a letter you have to sign. Do you accept to participate? And I said, yes, I'll sign. I showed it to my uncle. He said, what's this for? And I explained how this Frenchman had come and what had happened. And he said, I don't understand anything. These people are crazy. And he said, everything that you had been doing? And he said, I don't understand anything. You can go. We were told in the letter that we have to do a two-week uh, internship. And I said, well, when you go there, just, just do what you usually do. And that's how I came to go. And when I got there, there was the exhibition, and my pictures were shown in the uh, main conference center uh, that had been built by the Chinese back then. And the president, uh, the president Mali Alpha Omar Konare, then. Uh, uh, had come and he said, I understand, Art, that you've done some very nice work. And this is how I met the two leading uh, photographers of Mali who encouraged me and they said, you're, you're, you're fortunate, you're very young, keep working. So they gave you advice. So what did, what did they advise you to do? They said, Samuel, you're still very young. We Uh, because they were talking about the time when they were starting to recognize uh, African art. And they said, Senator, because you're young, you have a career ahead of you, so don't stop producing. And that's what I did. So you did a lot of series, because this led to all these series that we're going to talk about. But before we talk about all these series, uh, starting in uh, 97, I have another question on the relationship with music. And this is true for uh, Ming Smith, but also for Joseph when he talked about the folk music in the series on gypsies. So you also have a relationship with music. For instance, the idea that oftentimes the pictures are square, I mean, the format is square. Just like uh, you know, uh, LP covers. And this morning I was with James Barnard, a fantastic photographer. Worked for uh, Gamma, who lives in London, and he showed me many of these uh, LP covers that he's made with his pictures. And it reminded me that I have to ask you this question: the relationship to music, and. Uh, to what extent your square format is somehow related to the format of an LP cover. Actually, truth be told, no, it's not really because of the format of LP covers. Don't forget that the film that we use for black and white that we call 6 by 6 is square. And that's the format that you're looking at. 
And I'm a photographer, but I also do my own prints. And when I print, I reframe and I crop. And I print it uh, according to whatever format I want to end up with. And even uh, uh, photographers who were doing studio portraits of musicians, they use this format. So it's not really because of the idea of uh, music. I thought you were going to talk about this. It's true, I, I love uh, music. And this is like, of course, inspired by Prince and this particular outfit. And I would not only dress like they did, but I'd also take the pose because I loved uh, these people. And then we did the uh, Tati series in France because I was thinking about Afro-Americans. Do we have pictures from the Tati series? And you're going to see, this is still me in the 1970s. This is the Dati series. So what's the story here? Many people know Fabien Waki, who is the old uh, CEO of Tati. And to celebrate the 50th anniversary of uh, the sh store, which was a store that sold uh, cheap goods to a lot of Africans. And the economic advisor of uh, the CEO had said, what if we or his advisor wanted to use uh, uh, the Polaroids, and then they started to sell it, the disposable camera. And supposedly they sold millions of such pictures, you know, disposable cameras. And so to celebrate the 50th anniversary, And I think this was back in 1998. He thought he was doing something very good for photographers by selling these uh, cameras. So he had the idea of uh, uh, asking three uh, major uh, African photographers to participate in the ceremony. And we had done some studio work in Barbès in the area where the store is. So we built a studio under a tent, and that's where we worked. And because I didn't have uh, the enough money, and I said, can we have some, some accessories to do what I want to do? And they said, yeah, you can have anything you want. Go ahead and ask, because uh, Tati uh, has uh, the resources. And that's how I came to think about doing this picture. We rented all these things. And the liberated American woman. So this is a woman who was freed and no longer enslaved with a plantation of uh, cocoa, which symbol symbolizes Africa. 
and here's the businessman. Many uh, women have difficulties uh, with their businessmen husbands who don't uh, take care of their family and neglect them. This one is a woman. I heard this story about Africa and that Europe was different. This is a bourgeois woman, a middle-class woman, and it's true that the French also suffered. And you know, when the, with the rise of the bourgeois class, the poor people uh, suffered. So here is this middle-class African woman. There are many other series that we can't talk about. Uh, 666, just to mention a few. So uh, this was followed by a very frenetic activity. But I wanted to end today with a question about the non-realized uh, project, a project that was too... Uh, too broad or gr vast to, to carry out, something that was utopian. Did, is there a project that you would have liked to have done that you haven't been able to realize? We can't reveal all of our secrets. When I work, I don't reveal my secrets ahead of time, but I have many projects to conduct. I'm always looking for financing. I always have things that I want to do. But hopefully you can see in the book, uh, those of you who might uh, buy the book, that will come out in about 10 days. And you will see right from the beginning from the 1970s until <laughs> yeah, today we're in 2019 so there will be you'll see it all it's coming out soon so I'm just continuing but I can't tell you beforehand because I do not say I'm going to do something because I haven't if I haven't done it tomorrow what will you say so my uh, projects always come as a surprise and I, I, you can't say uh, I'm going to buy a car or what if what if you did buy a car and then it was stolen during the night what would you say oh. Merci beaucoup. And as we have little time left, I would like to ask Tyler Mitchell to join us uh, immediately and ask you all to give another very big round of applause for Samuel Fosso! Merci beaucoup. Merci. 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 Merci.